Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. And if you're a regular subscriber or listener, thank you for coming back. So I just want to remind everyone the crux of this show is to define wealth in its original meaning, a state of well-being. That's why we cover such a wide array of topics and have guests from all walks of life that appear here on the show. If you've been tuning in lately, you've probably heard guests talk about national security, entertainment, health, economics, and so much more. But today we're going to bring it really back to the genesis of the show, which is my bread and butter as a CFP, and we're going to touch on personal finance. Today's episode is what is IRA maximization? So IRA maximization is a strategy that a lot of folks in the industry, whether they're accountants or advisors or wealth managers, are probably relatively familiar with. And some of the consumers out there may have heard of it, but aren't too clear on what the details are. So we're going to spend some time in a moment getting into the who, what, when, and where of IRA maximization. But before we do that, I just want to introduce the topic by giving a quick update on our retirement system here in the U.S. So I think it's best to look at our retirement system as a stool with three legs. The three proverbial legs are comprised of social security, defined benefit pensions, and private savings. So social security still makes up the cornerstone of retirement here in America. It accounts for the bulk of income for most retirees out there. Now I know social security's long-term solvency has been called into question. Uh, The alarm has been sounded by many economists and politicians alike. You've probably heard me talk about it or read some of the articles I've uh, put together on the topic. If you haven't, go back and check them out. Uh, It's definitely a concern. This is something that so many retirees bank on, and it is one of the biggest entitlement programs that we have in our country, and funding it is very, very difficult. Defined benefit pensions would make up the second leg of that stool. And defined benefit pensions have dwindled over the past several years for the same exact reasons that Social Security has been in trouble. They're difficult to fund. Both of these programs are accounted by making current day contributions. All right. In Social Security, that would be your FICA tax. Uh, In pension systems, that would be payroll deductions, typically, along with employer contributions. And what you're doing ultimately is creating a pool of assets that at some future point in time when we retire, we hope will be enough and adequate enough that it can provide a lifetime of guaranteed income. Now, naturally, we all retire at different ages. And when we do retire, if we're fortunate enough, that retirement horizon can also be different for everyone. For some folks, it might only be one year. For other people, it might be 30 or 40 years, as perhaps they live to 100 and spend more of their years in retirement than they did in their career. So trying to create a stream of income that can last this indefinite and uncertain period of time is a tall order. And if we get into population dynamics and some of the other things I talk about, you'll see how funding them is becoming more and more difficult each year. So that third leg of the stool, that is what is comprised of private savings. All right. Since the early 1980s, the U.S. government has made a real push to try and incentivize private savings, to try and take the pressure off of those other two legs of Social Security and pension systems. Private savings, which we're really going to hone in in today's episode, is most synonymous in the retirement space with qualified retirement plans, in particular, the IRA or Individual Retirement Arrangement, and then workplace retirement plans, or sometimes what are called defined contribution plans. They are called that because we know what the contributions are that are going into it. We know how much we put in or how much we deduct from our pay each year, but we do not know what we're going to get on the back end, 10, 20, 30 years from today, what that balance may look like. So again, those defined contribution plans in the workplace, you'll hear terms like the 401k, uh, for for profit employers, the 403B for nonprofits or some hospitals or teaching institutions, uh, the 457, or the Thrift Savings Plan or TSP for federal government workers. 
What these plans are, are what they call tax advantaged retirement plans. And I'll put tax advantage in air quotes if you're watching, because we're gonna start to define if those are advantages or not, and what exactly they do for you now and in the future. And then ultimately, a lot of these assets eventually find their way into the IRA, the Individual Retirement Arrangement, or what is informally called the Individual Retirement Account. So without further ado, we're gonna dive right into the IRA maximization and how to get the most out of your IRA. Is going to require work and time and sweat and toil. If money wasn't an issue, what would I be doing? Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Change is the only constant. The Cadena Podcast. Okay, welcome back. So before we dive into what exactly this strategy is, I think it's important we understand at least the basis of the history of the IRA and how it's actually utilized. Remember, when we're talking about financial planning, in particular retirement planning, it's good to kind of separate it into two segments. You have the accumulation phase, which is when we're accumulating assets, we're working in our career, and we're putting money away for the future. And then you have the decumulation or distribution phase. That's when we actually retire and we start to unwind those assets and get to enjoy them. But let's look at the traditional IRA. The traditional IRA was invented in 1974 as a part of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, or called ERISA. The primary draw in this goal of boosting personal savings were the, again, quote unquote, tax advantages of the IRA. So what the IRA did then and still does today is it allows savers to make tax deductible contributions, which can then grow tax deferred. All right, so we're putting money into the IRA, into this bucket. We can take a tax deduction this year against our income. And then as we invest those assets, however we choose, whether it's in bonds or stocks or mutual funds or ETFs, they then grow over time and they continue to grow tax deferred. All right, for context here in 2024, the IRA contribution limit is $7,000 a year. And if you're over the age of 50, you can make what's called a catch-up contribution of an additional $1,000, making the total, of course, $8,000 a year. However, IRAs don't just grow organically. And what I mean by that is they're not just growing based upon those contributions directly to the IRA and the growth therein. Most, I venture to say most IRA assets today actually come by way of rollover. And what a rollover is, is when someone separates service from their employer, whether it be because they retired or they got laid off or they just decided to change jobs, they then take that old 401k or that 403b or TSP, whatever it may be that they had, and they then roll those, over, those assets over into an IRA. And the intent behind doing that is that they get to continue deferring the tax bill there. Okay, so it's not a distribution. They're not taking ownership of those assets in their day to day lives as far as, say, putting it into a checking account. But rather, what they're doing is a rollover from the 401k into the IRA, continuing to defer those taxes, but also giving them a little bit more control or investment flexibility in that new account. So now, employers, uh, you know, a lot of the big employers out there that offer these workplace retirement plans. Again, those are those acronyms, the 401k, 403b, TSP. These are all codes within the Internal Revenue Tax Code. That's where they come from. Now, the contribution limits within these plans are much greater than just in the traditional IRA. In tax year 2024, employees can put away up to $23,000 annually into such plans. And for those over the age of 50, they can have a catch-up contribution of $7,500, which brings that total then to $30,500 a year that some people can put away tax deductible into their 401k or whatever workplace retirement plan that they may have. Now, there's also SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, other sorts of tax deductible retirement plans that we're not going to touch on today, but by and large work in that similar fashion 
of we'll get a tax break today on the contribution. All right. So think of it as the seeds that we put in there, we're getting a de- 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 <laughs> that's a tongue twister. We're getting a deduction on. But then when they're in there, they grow tax deferred. But what we're going to get to in a moment is it is not a tax savings. Rather, it's better to identify this as a tax postponement. And it's very, very critical people understand that, or they could be into a rude awakening when they actually retire and start to live off of those assets. Okay. So naturally, as these contribution limits are much higher than what I mentioned for the IRA before, this is where people who have been putting away a substantial amount of their pay into their workplace retirement plan, perhaps maxing out those 401k contributions for years or decades, they naturally can have a much higher balance within there that when they eventually do retire, oftentimes those assets will find their way into an IRA plan. Okay. Again, with the intent of investment control and continuing to defer taxes. But remember, I said defer taxes, not save taxes, as inevitably we're essentially kicking the can down the road when it does come time to pay Uncle Sam. All right, so that's a little bit about the history of the IRA and how you actually fund these vehicles. Now, let's talk about some of the IRA tax concerns. Okay, so so far I've been talking about tax deductible contributions and tax deferred growth as quote unquote tax advantages. Remember, those were the original incentives that the government put into play back in the 70s and 80s and on to say, we're going to try and help you and incentivize you to pave your own way, all right, to save on your own so that you do not need to be so reliant on Social Security or the pension systems. All right. But what we want to remember is that, again, that's not a tax savings. It's a tax postponement. So we've talked about the front end. Now let's start to examine what actually occurs on the back end. And then that will lead us into today's strategy of IRA maximization. All right. So number one concern. Remember, we're putting money in in our working years into these retirement accounts. But then hopefully these assets are compounding over years and decades as we work throughout our career. And naturally, the whole point of investing is we want to grow that money. So what that means over 10 or 20 or 30 years of adding to your retirement account and investing, hopefully in a smart fashion and earning a return on those assets, one would hope that when they do retire, that pool of money, that nest egg is far greater than what they actually contributed to it. Now, what that leads into our first concern is when it comes time to actually distribute those assets. So we wanna live off of the IRA in retirement. We must remember that every dollar we pull out of there is going to be taxed as ordinary income, okay? And when we pull that money out, again, we're hoping it's far greater than what we initially put in 10, 20, or 30 years ago. So the key to remember is not only are we compounding our taxes, and, or excuse me, compounding our assets and growing our retirement account, we're also compounding and growing a future tax liability. All right. And some folks might say, hey, it would have been a lot easier to have paid taxes perhaps on $10,000 than after decades of compounding to try and pay taxes on $100,000. All right. So that's where when we have that conversation of the seeds versus the harvest, kind of a common analogy in this space, we have to remember that we have a investment partner of sorts in Uncle Sam, who at a future point in time will come to collect as we get to actually live off of that money. So I think that's concern number one, is that that pool of money we're hoping can be very, very large. And as such, the tax consequence will also be very large. Because remember, these distributions are not being taxed as capital gains. There's not a return of principal. There's not preferential treatment for interest or dividend income. Every dollar, both what we put in and all of the growth, will be taxed as ordinary income, okay? Which for many is the highest and the harshest tax that we face. The second concern, which we kind of weave into neatly here, is going to be what exactly is that tax liability? All right, it's very difficult, even for people in the know, a CFP, an economist like myself, to project what are taxes going to be four years or eight years from today 
as we change administrations, we see new priorities in Congress and in politics and so forth. Our tax history is all over the map, for lack of a better words. The income tax rate and the structure of our marginal tax system is always evolving based upon what's going on in our world and our system here in the U.S. So what that means is the tax rate that we may pay 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 years from today is an unknown. We cannot accurately predict what tax bracket we'll be in at that point in time and what the tax rates on those brackets will look like way down the road. So this is an important thing to realize is that the U.S. government has sought to alleviate the dependence on Social Security and underfunded pensions through incentivizing these tax advantages on private retirement plans. But the incentives on pre-tax IRAs focus more on the front end as opposed to the back end. Okay, and if we look at, you know, to kind of sidebar a little bit on what the future may look like. As of today, the latest numbers, according to the Congressional Research Services report in 2023, shows that there are $11.5 trillion of assets in IRAs. And there are an additional $26.3 trillion in employer-sponsored retirement plans, all right, much of which will eventually find its way into IRAs. So as the U.S. currently grapples with over $34 trillion of outstanding debt, and we have all of these unfunded liabilities that I've been referencing in Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, and pension systems and the like, politicians will stay aware of this potential tax revenue on that $38 trillion of retirement assets that I just alluded to. So our tax rate's going to be higher or lower, you know, 20, 30 years from today. That's certainly up for conjecture. But if we look at just our balance sheet as a country, I'll let you do the math. Now, that second point, that unpredictability of what the future tax liability might be, that also brings in some other points uh, that might be a little bit ancillary to the tax consequence. Okay, most pre-tax retirement assets cannot be accessed before 59 and a half without being subject to both income taxes and a 10% premature distribution penalty. Now, there are exceptions that apply to that rule, but by and large, you want to look at this money that you're putting away in your IRA or your 401k as long-term retirement money. Okay, now hopefully the retirement saver is prudently planning for retirement. And that wouldn't be a concern. But of course, you know, the unexpected does happen. And sometimes we need to access that money prematurely. But the greater concern, and where eventually we're going to get to this IRA maximization strategy, again, is on the back end. Okay. Traditional IRAs are subject to what are called the required minimum distributions or RMDs. Required minimum distributions essentially force the saver or the IRA owner to eventually start taking money out of the retirement plan and naturally triggering income taxes, all right? RMDs start at the age of 72 or at the age of 73 if you reach age 72 after December 31st of 2022, all right? So for moving forward for most folks that aren't there yet, they're going to be looking at their RMDs occurring at the age of 73, okay? Now, what happens in, in where this IRA maximization strategy is most prevalent is in the higher net worth scenario, okay? Perhaps I should have led in with that, but I think that this can add context for everybody. Whether you find yourself in that situation or not, understanding the full picture, I think, will be very beneficial. So some retirement savers may find that between Social Security income, perhaps an employer pension, Maybe they have real estate rental income or portfolio interest and dividends, a variety of sources of income that they do not need to access their IRA, or perhaps they don't want to because they say, I don't need this money. And as I draw from it, it's just going to create more of a tax issue for me. All right. So for those people, normally what they've done is they said, I'll keep deferring, deferring, deferring. All right. Meanwhile, those assets hopefully are growing, growing and growing until eventually the IRS says you need to take the money out because you hit that magical age of 72 or 73 and it's time to take your RMDs. 
And then often what people in those scenarios will then do is say, okay, I'm only going to take the RMD. I don't want to take more because, again, it's creating a tax issue. So I'll just take the RMD. And then this asset, I'll eventually look at this as a part of my legacy. It's something that I could leave my heirs, kids, grandkids, et cetera. This is what leads us into today's topic, the, the name of this episode, the IRA maximization strategy. So for people in the scenario that say, I want to defer, and I know that there's a very high likelihood I'm going to eventually pass away at some point, and then all of this money in my IRA is then going to go to my heirs. Now, back when, all right, previously in times, people could say, all right, I'll leave the big IRA to my kids or grandkids. Maybe they don't have as much money or as high income as I do. And then what they could do is actually stretch. All right, that's the common term. They would stretch the IRA over the course of their lifetime. So now, as opposed to the RMDs being predicated or based on the original IRA owner's age, as they're in their 70s or 80s, and those distributions get bigger and bigger, now it will be based on a much younger individual, that child or grandchild, let's say. And now they're at a younger age and they can actually take out those assets all the way throughout their lifetime for the next 40, 50 years. And so again, they keep deferring and deferring and with gradual distributions, maybe they weren't as wealthy as mom and dad or grandma or grandpa, and the tax liability in theory could be less on those individuals. All right, that was often called the stretch IRA. Now, the issue is since the SECURE Act of 20, 2019, most non-spouse beneficiaries of IRAs must now take all of their RMDs within 10 years of the owner's death. So even if I'm only 30 years old and I inherited a gigantic IRA that I intended on distributing for the next 60 years of my lifetime, now again, since the passage of the SECURE Act of 2019, I most likely will have to spend down all of those assets or those millions of dollars in the IRA just over the next 10 years. And now to make matters worse, let's say that I'm in my peak earning years. Maybe I inherited that when I'm 50 years old. I'm finally kicking butt, making a lot of money in my career in the highest tax brackets. And now I need to distribute this IRA on top of everything. And I'm watching so much of my income go to Uncle Sam by way of income taxes, not to mention any potential estate or inheritance taxes that could go on top of that. And so that is where we introduce the IRA maximization strategy. Again, this is a strategy best suited for high net worth individuals or very high earners, perhaps business owners still receiving income in retirement, that it will work best for people who are nearing retirement or perhaps in the early, younger years of retirement. And there's options that may exist which can help them mitigate the tax liability on this nest egg. So remember where they use those quote unquote tax advantages all throughout their career on the front end, the accumulation phase, and they were getting those nice tax deductions. Now they can use quote unquote tax advantages on the back end. And the way that they can achieve this is through the unique tax benefits associated with life insurance. Okay. So for the IRA maximization strategy, there's a few different methods, but the primary, the most common, is by leveraging life insurance to help start to generate a tax-free benefit, okay? And so ultimately what it entails, and we'll kind of go over the basics here, is the IRA owner can use a combination of IRA distributions, maybe eventually those RMDs, along with other assets that they can start to spend down to fund the premiums of a permanent life insurance policy. Now, there's a whole slew of permanent life insurance policies out there, uh, which can go beyond the scope of this episode. You'll hear things like universal life, indexed universal life, variable universal life, uh, guaranteed universal life, and then ultimately whole life, okay? I personally prefer to use whole life for this strategy because of the guarantees associated with the product, all right? That has been the most popular as far as overall premium inflows going into the product. And it's also the longest standing. The different universal life policies I was just alluding to, a lot of them have only been around for perhaps 10 or 20 years, whereas most carriers whole life products 
go back 100, even 150 years, and they're more, let's say, tried and true versus some of these newer flavors. Okay, so I think a little bit more reliable as we start to introduce the strategy. So what happens is as long as the life insurance policy is structured appropriately and does not qualify as what's called a modified endowment contract or a MEC, its death benefit can be distributed 100% tax free. All right. And now I want to elaborate on that. The thing that's unique and inherent to life insurance is that, again, if structured appropriately, the death benefit is 100% income tax free. Okay, it may still be subject to inheritance and estate taxes, depending on that person's situation and what their net worth is. However, those additional taxes can be avoided depending on the estate planning that that individual does. Oftentimes, when they find themselves in these scenarios, again, high net worth individuals, they'll own their life insurance policies in a trust. All right. Most commonly, what's called an irrevocable life insurance trust or ILIT, which essentially is able to take that asset outside of their estate so that it does not get counted against their uh, gift lifetime tax credit um, that they're able to utilize, okay? So different ways here to make it both income tax-free, but also inheritance and estate tax-free. And again, the growth on the life insurance policy and the dividends and interest which it accrues would not be subject to capital gains tax or the taxes were normally associated with uh, of interest and dividends in a typical portfolio, okay? So the IRA maximization strategy entails steadily converting an asset that's subject to income and estate taxes, the IRA, into one that can be received tax-free by our beneficiaries via the life insurance. The life insurance policy can be put into an IOLT, again, as another strategy, to avoid estate and generation skipping taxes as well. This is something you definitely wanna consult your estate attorney on. So the younger and healthier an individual starts this strategy, the greater the benefits can be as life insurance premiums naturally go up with age and deterioration of any health issues. There are many factors to consider in all retirement planning scenarios, but for high net worth IRA owners who plan on leaving much of this asset to their heirs, the IRA maximization strategy can be a great approach to keeping Uncle Sam at bay. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. Wherever you're listening or watching, please subscribe, leave us a review, tell a friend. I can't tell you how much that helps in keeping this show going and also attracting some really cool guests like we've had here on the show. If you like this content, Again, go to my website, www.briancaderna.com, and be sure to sign up for my free weekly newsletter, which is called Weekly Wealthy Wisdoms. It goes out every Monday. It's a couple minute read, jam packed with different ways to increase your wealth. And of course, don't forget to check out my book, What Should I Do With My Money? In which, from a 10,000 foot view, I hit on every topic of importance in achieving wealth and conclude with some great personal finance tips. Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is intended for the general public and for informational purposes only. The show does not provide any recommendations or investment advice regarding any specific account type, service, strategy, or product, or to otherwise act in any fiduciary or other capacity. Please contact a financial professional for guidance and information that is specific to your situation. Brian Kaderna does not provide tax or legal advice. Please contact your accountant or legal advisor to discuss your situation. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by Park Avenue Securities, Guardian, or Kaderna Financial Team, and opinions stated are their own. All investments contain risk and may lose value. Past performance is not guarantee of future results. References to specific securities, asset classes, and financial markets are for illustrative purposes only and do not constitute a solicitation, offer, or recommendation to purchase or sell a security. Brian Kaderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 300 Broadacres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003. Phone number 973-244-4420. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Kaderna Financial Team is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0K04194.